Hello, I am Professor Sims, and in this video I will discuss microbial growth and control. This is the second of 10 lessons for my Fundamentals of Microbiology course. If you're a student currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and course Moodle site for assignments, quizzes, due dates, and other course information. There's quite a few learning objectives for this lesson. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, binary fission, growth curves, different forms of reproduction that are not binary fission, such as budding fragmentation, also biofilm formation, form sensing, biofilm communities, and how they communicate with each other, cell-to-cell -cell communication, coordination of activities. Categories of microbial growth requirements. So this is stuff like oxygen, pH level, temperature, barometric pressure, osmotic pressure, and humidity and light. And we'll talk a little bit about culture media, how to grow bacteria. Of course, you'll have a lot more of that in the lab class as well. Chemical and physical methods for controlling bacterial growth and um, methods for testing the effectiveness of antiseptics, disinfectants, and sterilants. We're looking at microbial growth. Binary fission is um, asexual reproduction. The cells are dividing, and what happens first is the genetic material that replicates. Then we have division or budding, and then we have terminal spores. So that's what we end up with at the end. This here, figure 9-2, is a really cool picture taken from an electron micrograph. It is looking at a salmonella species. It's first thing that has to happen before reproduction is replication of DNA. And then you have a septum that forms in the center of the cell. And then you have two daughter cells, which are similar in size from each other and also similar to in size to the mother cell. So this is the mother cell. Its DNA is replicating and the cell elongates and then you have septums form, and then you end up with two daughter cells. That essentially is the basics of binary fission. The generation time depends, it's the doubling time for the population, okay? So each cell begets two new cells, which also begets two new cells, right? So then you have this kind of exponential uh, reproduction. So the first generation, you have one mother cell, and then that one get, begets two daughter cells. Both of those daughter cells beget two, so you end up with four. Both of the, all of those four beget two more daughter cells, so you end up with eight. So one, three, seven, fifteen cells from one in just three rounds of binary fission. So in a closed system, this is like in incubation in a lab or uh, without outside interference from other living organisms, that kind of thing. But the growth phases go like this. There is the lag phase, the log phase. So this is the lag phase here where the cells are not dividing. The log phase is what we just saw where the cells are growing and dividing exponentially. The stationary phase is kind of like an equilibrium where the the number of cells plateau, you know, maybe they are, they're running out of food or conditions are no longer favorable for reproduction. And then the decline or the death phase, this is where either they have completely run out of food, they're starving to death, or something else is going on to where the cells can no longer divide and reproduce and eventually they end up dying off. So this is the growth, the growth curve. Measuring how many cells are in a particular sample, there are several methods of doing this. One of the methods, and this is by far not the only method, but one of the most popular, easiest, cheapest, quickest method is to do pore plates or spread plates with bacteria that's been serial diluted, serially diluted. And then we determine the amount of viable cells that were in the original froth culture by counting the colony forming units in the plates that we end up with. So this is kind of confusing. I understand. But what happens is if you were to take a broth or, or a liquid that has bacteria in it and you just tried to count it 
Well, first of all, it's hard because you can't see it with the naked eye. And then if you try to put it under a microscope, it would be just impossible. I mean, how are you, you going to just count thousands or hundreds of thousands, millions of cells by observing them, right? So what we do instead is we take a specified amount, in this case it's one mil, from that specimen, the liquid specimen, and then we set up these tubes that have broth or water in them. Usually it's broth, and it's a measured amount, right? So all of these tubes start out with nine mils of just sterile broth. Then we take one mil of the original culture, put it in the first tube, and then mix that up, right? Take a mil out of there and put it in the second tube, mix that up, and then take a mil from there, put it in the next tube, take a mil from there, put it in the next tube, take a mil from there. So what's happening is, is we're getting more and more dilute as we go along. So this one has a 10 to the negative 1 concentration of the original sample. This one is 10 to the negative 2 as related to the original sample. 10 to the negative 3 here, 10 to the negative 4, 10 to the negative 5. And then we take just a little bit from each one of these and put them on an agar plate. You can either do the pour method where you just pour it across, pour it into the agar as the agar is solidifying, or you can do the spread plate method where you take that specimen and spread it across the surface of a plate that's already solidified. Either way, and then you incubate them and you have them grow out, and you have to find what is known as a countable plate. A countable plate has to have somewhere uh, between, I think it's 20 and 300 colonies. So in this case, it would be this plate here. And once you find a countable plate, you count the numbers of colonies on that plate, and then you do a little bit of math to figure out how many, uh, based on how many colonies are on this plate, how many cells were in here. And there is a formula for that, but essentially it's knowing the uh, concentration of this solution, how much you diluted it, so this was what, 10 to the negative 4, and then you use the volume that you pipetted and all that stuff, you do some math, and you trace it back to the source to see how many viable cells of that bacteria were in the original broth. This is kind of a variation on that where you use membrane filtration to count live cells in dilute solutions, so this is very helpful if you don't have access to solid media or if you're working with bacteria that won't grow on media. There are a lot of bacteria that simply just won't grow on agar. We use this to determine the most probable cell number and it is really similar. It's really similar to um, serial dilution. It's just it's using all liquid and then uh, it is also using lactose broth tubes and this is useful, if, especially if you're looking at something that can ferment lactose, because you can estimate the most probable cell number by looking at the change in the color of the broth, because, and you'll learn about this some more later, but in lab, but if you are using phenol red broth, you can test for fermentation, because the fermentation will decrease the pH, and decreasing the pH in phenol red broth leads to a color change from red to yellow. Okay, so that's a way to do it without without having to use solid media. There's an indirect method. Um, this has to do with measuring turbidity. Turbidity is like the cloudiness in a broth. So the more turbid it is, the more cloudy it is, the more bacterial cells you have growing in there. You can use a spectrophotometer to measure the turbidity because it, it, it can show you, you know, how much light is getting through. So if you have very little light that's getting through the specimen, the light gets refracted off and not very much makes it through. Whereas if, if a whole lot of light is getting through, well, that means there's not very much turbidity. Okay, so that's a pretty simple concept. But it does have to do with different wavelengths of light and optical density and all of this fancy, fancy stuff. But essentially what it's doing is it's measuring how much light gets through. It's being shined through a sample and whether it bounces off or it gets through to the other side, essentially that is how a spec works, a spectrophotometer. It's just measuring how turbid the broth is.
This is figure 9.1 um, showing a biofilm that's been growing on, uh, on top of a catheter. And this is an example of how um, biofilms can be pathogenic, but they also sometimes can be beneficial. Like, like this one here is an example of biofilm growing on top of rainwater. And you've seen it. You've seen like the, the kind of funky, mucky layer on top of swamp water. Well, it turns out a lot of the ecosystem kind of depends on those biofilms because they provide food uh, for fish and, and other marine life. But essentially all a biofilm is is a whole bunch of bacterial cells that have been communicating with each other and coordinating and they form this big kind of a community of cells. So what happens is the cells attach to some kind of substrate and they become sessile. Uh, don't let that word, you'll see sessile or sessile uh, a few times here and there. Don't let that word confuse you. All it means is that it's anchored to something. It's, it's attached. And then they communicate with each other via what is known as quorum sensing. They kind of strengthen each other. They're, they're usually resistant to antibiotics and disinfectants. This is figure 7, 9, 9 17, and it shows this, the stages of the formation of a biofilm. So it does, it just starts with a few little cells, and then they become what is known as sessile, which is irreversibly attached. And they grow, and they divide, and they form like little water channels in between each other. And then they're secondary colonizers. And then they have microbes that disperse and go on to form new biofilms. So, so those are the stages of biofilm development. Uh, let's move on to oxygen requirements, section 9.2. The first two here are obligate, obligate, obligate aerobes, obligate anaerobes. So aerobe means that they, um, that they use oxygen. Anaerobes means that they can't use oxygen or they can't live in oxygen. Obligate aerobes means they absolutely have to have oxygen because they can't make energy or reproduce without it. Obligate anaerobes means that they can, they absolutely cannot use oxygen. They can't live in the presence of oxygen. Facultive anaerobes and aerotolerant anaerobes. Facultive anaerobes are kind of the best of both worlds because they grow better in oxygen but they don't have to have oxygen. So they can live pretty much wherever they feel like it. Um, in aerotolerant anaerobes, they don't use oxygen to make energy, but they can survive in the presence of oxygen. Microaerophiles are a pain in the butt to grow in the lab because they need oxygen to grow, but if they have too much oxygen, it will kill them. So you have to find a very happy medium. And this is, you know, just another artifact of the fact that bacteria live in all different kinds of places. So the fact that different bacteria have different oxygen requirements means that they absolutely can live in all the niches in the, in the environment. Places with low oxygen, places with high oxygen, places with a little bit of oxygen, you know, they, they, they get in where they fit in. They've had billions of years to evolve. And this is just showing the characteristics of these different oxygen requirements, like if you were to grow them in the labs. If you inoculate a deep with bacteria, and that bacteria grows only at the surface and nowhere in the middle or near the bottom. If this is solid agar in here, you have very low levels of oxygen near the bottom, you have some oxygen near the top, and you have the most oxygen at the top. So obligate aerobes are only going to grow at the top where they have plenty of oxygen. Obligate anaerobes are only going to grow at the bottom where there's very little or no oxygen. Uh, facultive anaerobes are going to grow best where there is more oxygen, but they can still grow without oxygen. And aerotolerant anaerobes, those are the ones that don't use oxygen to make energy, but they can survive in the presence of oxygen. So they're going to grow throughout the media. And then microaerophiles are only going to grow where there's just a little bit of oxygen, not where there is no oxygen and not where there's plenty of oxygen. Bacteria are generally neutrophiles. What that means is that most bacteria grow at neutral pH, pH of 7. And in fact, all pathogenic, like all human pathogens, well, most of them are going to be at pH of 7 because that's 
you know, your blood is neutral. Now, what isn't neutral in your body is your stomach. So if you have pathogens that live in the stomach, those have to be able to live in low pH, and those are called acidophiles. They grow in low pHs, pH near 3 approximately. And then alkalophiles grow at high pHs. So this is how it looks if you charted it out. Growth rate, pH. So low pHs, acidic environments, acidophiles thrive. A mid range pH, neutral, neutrophile. And then alkaline environments, high pH, alkalophile. Temperature affects microbial growth as well. Some grow at very low temperatures. So this is growth rate of bacteria and temperature in degrees Celsius. If you start at negative 10, zero degrees Celsius is freezing. That's the temperature where water freezes. So these guys can live in very cold environments, and those are called psychrophiles. Mesophiles are the ones that live in the middle range. So uh, room temperature is, uh, what is it, about 20, 24 degrees Celsius, 26. And then your body temperature is... Uh, 37 degrees Celsius. So this is middle range. Mesophiles grow in middle temperatures. Thermophiles grow in pretty hot temperatures. And then hyperthermophiles. So here 100 degrees Celsius is the temperature where water boils. You do have bacteria that can live in temperatures that high. In fact, you have temp bacteria that live in hot springs. Okay. So those are hyperthermophiles. Very high temperatures. Halophiles and halotolerant bacteria. This has to do with salt. So halophiles require a high salt concentration in order to survive. Halotolerants um, can grow in the presence of high salt, but they don't require it for growth. Halotolerant pathogens are an important source of foodborne illnesses because they contaminate foods preserved in salt. So forever and ever, you know, hundreds and, and probably thousands of years, people have used salt to preserve food because it sucks the moisture out. And most bacteria need quite a bit of moisture to survive. But halotolerant pathogens can still live in that food because they do well in high salt, salt concentration. Most bacteria require a lot of water, a lot of moisture, um, as do we. Photosynthetic bacteria use the energy from light. They, they can pull energy um, from the sun. Okay, and artificial growth media. Okay, so we're going to be looking at a lot of media in the lab class, but we do want to talk about it somewhat in lecture as well. Artificial growth media are media, they're, they're substances. Um, they can be liquid or solid and they contain chemically added components so like nutrients and, and different levels of salt and other kinds of things are added to the media in order to promote growth of certain bacteria that you want to study so before you can study bacteria you have to isolate it you have to grow it out and then you have selective media where you can put different things in the media in order to promote the growth of certain types of bacteria and inhibit the growth of other types of bacteria. We're going to get into selective and differential media a lot, lot more in lab six. But for the lecture purposes, you just want to make sure you know the difference between artificial growth media, selective media, enriched, and differential media. Enriched media contains essential nutrients to a specific organism. Most media contains something that is targeting something. I mean, you have your general growth media where you just want to grow anything, you know, anything that will grow in a lab will grow in that. Selective media is specifically inhibiting the growth of something else, something undesirable. And, and this becomes important when you're trying to reduce contamination and things like that. Enriched media usually has some specific component, like some growth factors or blood cells or something, where you, you're really, really kind of targeting one type of microbe. And differential media is actually used to test. It's used mostly for identification purposes. So if you need to see if something um, is a coliform or it, form, it, it can ferment 
a type of sugar or something like that, you would use differential media. And if that specific uh, microbe is present, you can see it, you can observe it because the color of the media or the color of the bacteria will change. Uh, this here is a, an example of McGonkey agar that's had E. coli streaked on it and it's incubated and grown. This is where the E. coli is. And then up here is Serratia morsensis. I can never say that word. Serratia morsensis. So the Serratia does not ferment the lactose that's in the gonkey, so it has this off-white color, which is the same as it would look essentially. Well, it's kind of like a light pink off-white. That's how it would look on general growth media. Uh, whereas E. coli has this nice bright pink color change that has come from the fact that E. coli does ferment the lactose that is in the McGonkey media. So that is an example of differential media. Um, biosafety levels. So you've talked some of that. We've talked some about this in um, the lab with, with the safety stuff and all the guidelines. Just have a look through here what constitutes a BSL-1, BSL-2, 3, 4. This has to do with protecting people that are working with bacteria and, and it has to do with the infectivity of the different agents, how easily they're transmitted, and how potentially severe the disease could be if you were to become contaminated. Our micro lab is a BSL-2 lab, which means that the, most of the microbes are normal flora. They're typically indigenous. They're associated with some disease, but it's usually not very, very severe. And they pose moderate risks to the workers in the environment. So when you talk about controlling microbial growth, essentially what you're talking about is killing bacteria or um, preventing them from being able to reproduce. So Generally, we're looking, first of all, we're looking at disinfection or antisepsis, and this is removing pathogens from fomites. If you remember, fomites are inanimate objects that um, can become reservoirs for bacteria or microbial loads. It reduces, disinfection and antisepsis reduces the microbial load, but the microbes may remain um, unless the chemical is strong enough to be considered a sterilant. So if something is sterile, that means there, it's not the microbial load has been reduced. It doesn't exist anymore. It is not there anymore, right? There is zero microbial growth. Now, the level of cleanliness that is needed, so you're talking about either sterilization where something is completely free of microbes versus a high level of disinfection or just general cleanliness, okay? This depends on how you're using an item, if you're talking about fomites. If something has to be sterile if it's working with stuff that's sterile. So if this is, you know, surgery or it's something that is considered a critical item must be sterilized. Something that is semi-critical would be like a high level of disinfection. Non-critical would be it's, if it's something that um, it's sufficient that your skin can protect you, then it's, it's considered a non-critical item. So an example of this would be uh, if a doctor is examining your, your ears, they wouldn't necessarily want to be shoving bacteria in there. So that would be considered a semi-critical item where they put the new cap on the but um, if they are just looking at wounds on your skin or, or if they're just examining you, giving you a general examination, then they might just be wearing gloves that aren't sterile, that haven't been disinfected. Sterilization is really necessary with a lot of medical applications. It's necessary in food. Um, and an example that the book gives is when you're dealing with Clostridium botulinum. Um, yeah, obviously you don't want to be getting botulism in your foodstuffs. This is figure 13.4. There's, They have different factors that you can consider when you're developing protocols for uh, working with microbes and determining the cleanliness level that is needed. Um, so just, just have a look through that. We talked about some of it already. Some methods, physical methods of control. Heat is very effective. We will be using um, these guys, Bacta incinerators, also known as Bacta incinerators, also known as Bacteria incinerators. Anyway, 
what it is is it's basically a safer form of using a Bunsen burner um, wherein you don't need to run gas and you don't have an open flame right um, these are run with electricity and it's just a heating element that you use to heat your inoculating instruments to sterilize them and that is an example of dry heat sterilization which is very commonly used in a lab. A more effective heat sterilization actually would be uh, moist heat so using water and it's more effective than dry heat because it, it can penetrate cells better but moist heat is not always practical so dry heat is very practical for you know day-to-day -day bench work but a lot of things that are stored and used can be anything that can be sterilized ahead of time we generally autoclave those. An autoclave is a machine that uses moisture and high pressure and heat in conjunction in order to sterilize instruments, things like glassware, also media, you know, all kinds of stuff. So those, those are routinely used. Um, pasteurization is also a physical method and this is used really, really commonly in dairy products and it has to do with heat and they have varying times. For instance, you can have heat milk that's heated for 72 degrees for 15 seconds and then it's refrigerated. Or you can have, and that's the kind of milk that you get and when you bring it home it has to be, still be refrigerated. You can have milk that's heated at a higher temperature for very short periods of time and then it's sealed in airtight containers. And these things don't have to be refrigerated. But there are minor differences and I, I would implore you to read through those um, but generally it's again it's just using heat to kill pathogens some more physical methods of course refrigeration freezing refrigeration slows down microbial growth freezing freezing can often kill microbes so very high temperatures very cold temperatures can be used to control growth desiccation we talked briefly briefly about this earlier desiccation is a fancy word for dry, like you're removing the moisture from something. Um, lyophilization, this is actually a combination of using cold temperatures and drying out a specimen and those, this allows for long-term term storage. But the microbes, they're not dead, they're still there and they can be rehydrated. Ionizing radiation, gamma irradiation, these are different ways to um, sterilize heat sensitive things, so things that can't be heated. A lot of your food, believe it or not, is subjected to gamma radiation. And non-iodizing radiation, an example of this is UV light. It's not able to penetrate surfaces, but it is useful for sterilizing the surface of things. So it can't get through the surface, but it can sterilize the surface itself. HEPA filtration is used in a lot of ventilation systems, especially hospitals and laboratories. And this is figure 1315 that shows that a lot of things can get caught up in a HEPA filter, which is pretty amazing. Like, look, even viruses, and viruses are so tiny. So those are extremely useful. They, nowadays, they even have HEPA filters, HEPA filters in your vacuum cleaners. It's really cool. Another physical method is membrane filtration. So again, this is another way to filter out microbes and remove bacteria from things that can't be heated enough to kill them. So sometimes you're working with stuff that you, you just can't heat. Maybe you're working with some serum or some blood or something that's really sensitive and cannot be heated enough to kill the bacteria that way. These are some chemical methods of control. I know there's a lot going on here, but of course your heavy metals, mercury, silver, copper, zinc, um, these can be used for disinfection and preservation, but of course some heavy metals are toxic. And so, you know, you don't want to just be flinging these around really nilly. You gotta be very careful. Halogens like chlorine, fluorine, iodine, they're very common disinfectants. Uh, chlorine compounds, sodium hypochlorite, chloramines, chlorine dioxide are used for water disinfection routinely. Iodine tincture and iodophore forms. Okay, those are both considered antiseptics. Alcohol, of course, ethyl alcohol, isopropyl alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol is the rubbing alcohol that you use at home. Ethyl alcohol, we use a lot of that in the lab. Um, those are both antiseptics that denature proteins and disrupt cell membranes. 
Phenols are stable, long-acting disinfectants. They also denature proteins, disrupt cell membranes, and they're found in a lot of your household cleaners, like you know, Mr. Clean, that kind of thing. Uh, they're also in mouthwashes and hospital disinfectants. More chemical methods, we've got surfacants, like soaps and detergents. These are actually mechanically carrying away microbes. It, it breaks bonds and, and lowers surface tension of water. Those are technically chemical, but it's really more of a physical method. They're mechanically removing microbes. They're not killing them. Uh, chlorhexidine and alexidine are commonly used for surgical scrubs, again, um, and they're also used in prescription oral rinses. Alkylating agents, sterilized materials at low temperatures. So again, if you have things that are temperature sensitive, but a lot of them are carcinogenic and are irritants, so you will be careful with those. Formaldehyde um, can be used to preserve tissue specimens. Um, they're used in some vaccines, and they inactivate infective agents. So in effect, they're not killing them, but they are making it to where that they can't reproduce. Ethylene oxide is a gas sterilant. And it's useful because it can permeate heat-sensitive packaged materials, but it's a little scary because it is explosive, and it's also a carcinogen. Peroxygens, this includes your hydrogen peroxide, parasitic acid, benzoyl peroxide, ozone gas. They produce free radicals in cells, which damage their macromolecules. And chemical preservatives are added to food a lot, things like sorbic acid, benzoic acid, propionic acid. They have soluble salts, which inhibit enzymes and reduce pH. They're interfering with the microbial cell's ability to reproduce and to make energy. Uh, sulfites are used in winemaking and food processing. Uh, to, so browning of foods. So yeah, this is like when your, your apples turn brown right after you cut them, or your guacamole turns brown in the fridge. Sulfite is used to preserve foods to keep them from doing that. Nitrites also are used in preservation, usually in meats. But cooking nitrite preserved meats can also, again, it's like everything causes cancer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> nicin and nitomycin are naturally produced preservatives, and they're used a lot in cheeses and meats. I like those better than some of these other ones. Um, testing for the effectiveness of antiseptics and disinfectants. I need to spend a whole, whole lot of time talking about this, but when you're testing for effectiveness, there are two really really classic methods of doing this. One of them is a disk diffusion method. Essentially, you do a spread plate, and then you put these little discs on there that have different either antibiotics or sterilants or disinfectants, and you put those right on top of the agar media. And then when you let it incubate, and if you don't have any interruption here, like you see how there's bacteria all over this plate, um, this is not effective. This one has some effectiveness where there's like a little zone of inhibition around it. Over here there's a whole lot more of these big huge zones, these big areas around the discs where none of the bacteria have grown. Though that shows very high effectiveness at um, disinfecting or otherwise inhibiting microbial growth. There's a way to do this kind of in reverse where you have a disinfectant that has been used and then you can do, this is kind of similar to the serial dilution method where you can kind of grow out that disinfectant, you know, inoculate some plates with that to see if some bacteria is in there. If there's bacteria in the disinfectant, then that disinfectant is not killing the bacteria, right? And remember, if anything is growing on the plate, that's dead bacteria. So. That's a really good way to test the disinfectant itself for its effectiveness. This concludes lesson two. I want to thank you guys, as usual, for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description down below for more videos related to these topics. And leave your questions for me in the comments section below.